Hello everyone! Welcome to another episode of Reacting Reddit, where real humans read, react, and summarize trending content so we can cut through some of the bullcrap and make it easier for you to understand. Today we're going to be talking about the Paris Climate Agreement. This has nothing to do with Paris. You may think that it does, but it, 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 it was held in Paris. That's the only reason it's called the Paris Climate Agreement, okay? The agreement itself doesn't favor Paris, it's not about Paris, it's something else, okay? So we're gonna get into the history of what the agreement is, why it happened, right? What, how it, how it functions, why Trump left, and why Biden joined, the beliefs of these people, okay? So first off, what is the Paris Agreement? The Paris Agreement was a meeting with most of the world's leaders. Um, one thing to note is that this was quite, um, quite uh, an incredible event just for the fact that many world leaders, almost 200 world leaders were able to meet over something that wasn't related to war. And that just didn't really happen before. It wasn't really common at all. That, that was not a thing. There wasn't much communication on the global scale, right? So, this was one of the first times that happened, which made it, you know, memorable, made it an event, something to, to keep in mind, okay? And the way it functions is that every country makes its own goal for how it's going to reduce its contribution to climate change. And this is just because if the world gets too hot, we have a harder time living in it. There's more things that kill us humans, ultimately. Yeah, yeah, it's also getting out species and, and other things and melting the ice caps and crap. But it, at the end of the day, the, the driving force is the understanding that um, it leads to us having less land to work with and more traumatic weather, like more hurricanes, um, more of these kind of um, periods of no rain at all and periods of way too much rain instead of more balance and in between. Um, and this is uh, problematic because it has the total potential to disrupt the food chain, uh, the, su the supply chain of the world's food. And that's, that's obviously quite problematic, right? So you can feel how you want if, if you feel that's apocalyptic or it doesn't matter. That's a separate argument. It doesn't matter for the point of this. We're just talking about what the Paris Agreement is, not whether it's like a good thing or um, a bad thing or whatever, right? I, I will note that the Paris Agreement, what you contribute in the Paris Agreement is determined by you. So if you criticize or talk positively about it, it's important to keep this in mind because ultimately, um, like say that you feel your country is giving too much, right? Uh, it's on you to just change what your commitment is or fail to meet your goal, but then there's no consequence or punishment for that. It's not uh, it, It's not like a, a very strict agreement at all. It's more like an event that happened where world leaders were like, hey, we're willing to talk about this and make some statements about what we should do to be better, right? Which considering like 50, 60 years ago, Prior to that, um, you know, that was the end of, like, the World War era. It's like, that's quite, that's like a, hey, hey this is a, a peaceful problem to have, right? You know, to, to be able to talk about climate change, that's not something people give a fuck about if you're in war, right? So the fact that we're even able to have this argument is, I think, a really wonderful thing. It's really remarkable. Um, and again... The Paris Agreement, each country determines what your goal is. You determine how much you're going to spend. You are not forced to do anything. And there's no, like, consequence aside from you having to tell the other countries that you failed. That's it. So if you're going to say that the Paris Agreement sucks and we spend too much money on it, okay, spend le less money on the Paris Agreement. That's how it works. Uh, so... That's one of the common criticisms is how expensive it is. But it's a bit weird if you look into the agreement itself because it doesn't have any kind of... It doesn't force the United States to pay anything. Um, that's not what the agreement is about. The United States said it would pay stuff. So it's like, 
you can blame the agreement, but really you have to blame the previous U.S. politicians. I mean, if you're being straight up, right? Because I understand I'm saying like, we, the United States people can pick this, but really it's the politicians who are picking it, right? So the Paris Agreement is a bit controversial because um, Trump like left it, right? Like last minute, basically, uh, three years ago, three or four years ago. And so Biden just rejoined it last minute. And there's a lot of political motivation for all this it's basically like democrats are usually pro this and republicans are usually anti um and that's most of most of what you need to know about it it's it's just mostly important to understand that the paris agreement was one of the first peaceful meetings of almost all the world leaders and it doesn't force you to do anything your country is the one who says what you're going to do and what you're going to contribute. So with that in mind, it's, it's not really feasible that, you know, you can blame the agreement itself when your country is what gets you into the agreement. It's important to make the distinction that, yeah, maybe we're in a situation where we're over contributing or whatever. That's fine. But we're in that situation because we committed to that situation and past po- politicians of our country put us in that position, right? Not because the Paris Agreement sucks. <laughs> it's like our agreement, our part of the Paris Agreement sucks, but there's no need to withdraw. Like that, that was one thing that made Trump's withdrawing of this controversial because it's like you didn't need to. You could have just not financed the things and then gone to the meeting every five years and been like, hey, we thought it was too expensive, so we didn't do it. Like, it's <laughs> it's like withdrawing from it in that way it really adds that extra middle finger to the rest of the world. Like, it, it really, really does. Just because it just wasn't necessary. Um, he, he really easily could have just not, just not spent the money and just changed his mind about the, the agreement itself. Uh, didn't need to... To withdraw that way basically and arguably that had consequences because then other countries can be like well the usa is like the one of the biggest per capita increases like per usa person each usa person contributes more to global warming than like any other country other countries are bigger in their contribution but that's because they have way 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 more people individually those people do not hurt the picture as much as people in the USA. Um, so that's like, an, it kind of is on the US. Another point, my last point before we get into the comments is about the kind of burden of responsibility here because uh, there are parts, countries have agreed to help fund the developing world, so to speak. I personally, I hate this concept of developed and developing. I don't think it's that 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 simple, really, because there's a lot of situations now where growing technology has made the cost of technology in developing countries much cheaper, and they're able to progress faster than developed countries did with their inferior technology that they used for the same means in the past. If that makes sense, so the the more technology advances, the more advantageous it is to the developed developing countries, and the less advantageous it is to the developed countries, basically. So let's get to it. Let's see what people have to say about Biden rejoining the Paris Agreement. The first comment says, well, this is great from an optics perspective. Does this actually do anything? The Paris Climate Agreement is a non-binding for some reason. We need a binding climate agreement with actual penalties for failure to abide by it. A reply to that says, It's pure virtue signaling with no enforceable impact. Most U.S. companies and states were already moving towards implementing the goals of the Paris Climate Accord anyway because they want to appeal to environmentally conscious crowd while other countries part of the agreement. Note, potential paywall weren't meeting the goals of the accord. So, yeah, let's move on. I agree. Possibly unpopular opinion. Leaving was also primarily an optics play, because whether the U.S. is in the Paris Accord doesn't have much bearing on emissions, for the reason you mentioned. 
The good news is that emissions are already trending down in the US, and in many other places, and there is good reason to believe that can be accelerated, especially under a Biden administration that actually cares about accelerating it. Here we go, a reply to the statement, does this actually do anything? The US will have to give money to China and other developing nations to help them through industrialization. Otherwise, no. Edit. China is still categorized as a developing country, so they qualify for the Paris Climate Agreement Green Climate Fund. To date, they've been given 100 million USD from the program. Since countries set their own emission goals and there's no enforcement method to punish countries that don't meet those goals, the only thing joining the agreement means is that the US is going to start having to shell out taxpayer money to China and other developing countries. At least they'll be able to put that money to good use with all that free labor from the Uyghurs they have going on for them. Uh, I don't I don't remember how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. That's an ethical group in China. But so comments like this, you have to take everything with a grain of salt because this is very obviously from the US perspective. Like first off, like when you're talking about developing and developed countries, you're always going to offend people and it's better to just not even compare countries that way. You can talk about specific parts of countries. For example, the United States has a more developed landline infrastructure. Whereas Korea has a more developed LTE infrastructure than the United States. Actually, a lot of countries have a more developed landline infrastructure, or sorry, uh, LTE infrastructure than the United States. The United States is kind of behind. Even countries that would surprise you, like countries that you think are developing, are actually more developed in their LTE signal across their country than your country in the United States. But the United States is obviously a developed country, right? You get into this really sketchy territory and it's really better to just not kind of, to try whenever possible to not say that a country is developed or developing. You can say a part or an industry or a sector or a, a, a process or a group of people or something like that. That You have to be more specific and then you're less likely to cause kind of... Uh, Fri friction. Um, there's a lot of kind of mistakes that US people in particular make when they're talking to people in a global scene, right? Because the US is kind of a meme of the rest of the world in the sense that the world kind of revolves around the US and both has an appreciation and a hatred of that fact. And some people have no idea what's going on in the US. But in general, a lot of countries pay too much attention to the US. And that's just how it is, you know? So this makes, makes it, the experience of being in the US is just different. And it makes it hard to relate to people, especially if you're talking about somebody from China. So just be careful, right? Moving on. How many of the larger countries that can do anything would have joined if it was binding? I've always been under the impression that had it been binding, it would never have gotten the acceptance it did by the countries that are asked to drive progress. So if the options were no Paris Agreement or a non-binding Paris Agreement, I'll take the non-binding one every single time. It's, it's also very complex because how do you, that's the problem with the global scene. Like how do you, how do you punish somebody, right? for not meeting, it's complicated. Uh, I don't think it's that simple as they were like, well, we can either do this or this, which do you want? Oh, that one, okay, and now it's this one. I don't know if they were able to come to a conclusion on how they could effectively enforce it. That's why they like made a process to make you have to present yourself and like say if you failed so that you hoping that that shame would be motivating, which for some cultures it totally is. Like in Japan, People in Japan are more motivated by shame, which it sucks. Like as, as a person that sucks, but like people in other countries are more, they're more able to deal with shameful situations and just brush it off, right? Um, that's a cultural difference, so to speak. Another reply says, it's not just optics. It means the United States will be on the table again for discussions. Politics and policies is just discussions with impact. It's non-binding because countries like the USA would never agree to anything if it was binding. 
it's non-binding because after 50 years of discussions between all countries, they realize that that is the best way to go about it. Because believe it or not, climate change is not only the biggest issue affecting 190 countries of the world. <laughs> A reply to that says, yeah, well, that's not something Biden can give you. But you can rejoin the Paris Agreement signaling the U.S. wants to do more again. Another reply says it also had limits too high to make an impact. Let's hope all of that is tightened up in short order. We don't have time to let accelerating climate crisis be the next repeated mass disaster. <laughs> right out of COVID, right into whatever that looks like. Getting all the countries in the world to agree to something binding will be tough. Enforcing it will be borderline impossible. I'm not saying we shouldn't try. We obviously should because the alternative is destroying the planet. But the Accords were a first step, the world admitting it had a problem. The real work starts now, way too late, since Trump stuffed his cabinet with climate change deniers, but better late than never. You know, you, you could argue that climate change, what really drives it is when, for whatever reason, technological adaptation happens. Like, we... The United States as a nation has invested a lot of its infrastructure in coal, coal and these kind of energies. So in order to actually just not have those energy reliances and have the, the renewable forms of energy that are like way better technologies now and way, way, way more easy to use than they ever were before. Um, in order to have those we, we have to reinvest money in infrastructure. And this is kind of what I was getting at in earlier, is that it's actually what you find in, so to speak, developing countries is they are less prone to making infrastructure in ineffective old format ways. So like here in Nicaragua, for example, even though there's barely any money here, right? There's still tons and tons of, um, of turbines to collect power and solar panels absolutely everywhere. Because the cost of living is lower and electricity here is relatively expensive, a lot of people use some kind of offset to mitigate their electric, electrical bills and these kind of things or try and live off the grid. So you would think that here there's not that much solar power and wind turbines and that kind of thing. But it's actually pretty common for private individuals to have solar power because it's a tropical country. There's a part of the year where it's just rainy and cloudy, but for most of the year there's loads and loads and loads of sunlight. Um, and I'm just bringing this up because sometimes other countries are better off because they didn't have the infrastructure developed yet. And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around. And even if we make projections on how we can or can't change, what leads to climate change is about the decisions that the major players are kind of making on the infrastructure that they're kind of relying on. Because if we as a nation 80 years ago had been like, nah, screw coal, we hate coal, we hate oil, we don't want that shit, we gotta go all over the world to find that crap? Nah, we're just gonna go nuclear and other stuff and whatever. And I'm not saying that, oh, nuclear's a great option, I'm not, I'm not trying to get into that argument at all. I'm just uh, asking you to, to imagine, imagine that that happened 80 years ago. At this point, we, our carbon impact would be way, way, way smaller. Maybe, we, you know, we'd have a bunch of other problems, but it, there's the points that when large players make fundamental changes to their infrastructure, it causes carbon emissions to change drastically. And that's where you get into the controversy of this, is that you can play the game of being like, okay, how do we make this system 2% better? How do we make it 1% better? How do we make it 2% better? Um, but probably what makes more sense with climate change is to figure out how can we change the very things people rely on so that it's not even profitable anymore 
to burn coal and do this. Because if you can make it profitable to make solar energy and to transition to solar energy in these things, it, it makes it happen. And that's kind of the problem with a lot of politicians is that they focus too much on what sounds right instead of what influences people to change. And the biggest influence for people to change is by changing the circumstances so that things can become profitable, right? What you often see with technologies is that a technology exists, but it isn't adopted because it just costs too much money for it to be worth it. And there's a tipping point where it starts to be cheap enough that it's worth it, right? Like imagine that you could have someone come to your house, bring solar panels, install them completely free, and you got to just have the energy that that generated. You know, more people would have solar panels. Of course more people would have solar panels. But it's, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's still relatively quite expensive. It's way cheaper than it used to be, but still relative to the costs of living, <laughs> it's, it's a, an unnecessary added expense, right? And that at its core is why climate change doesn't have drastic changes because you can't just tweak, you know, you can't just be like, all right, we're, we're emitting 1% less, we're, we're keeping our fundamental oil reliance, but we're just reducing it a little bit. Like that, that doesn't lead to the fundamental change. If you want the fundamental change, you have to make it profitable for people to use green energy over coal and over cars. How do you make it profitable for people to use buses? Well, if you live in a city, you know that using a bus is great because you're gonna be stuck in traffic in either way. So buses are awesome. They're really time-saving, right? Whereas if you're in a rural area and you have a car, you're like, no, nah, I don't use a bus. Why would I use a bus? <laughs> it, it, like your circumstance changes how relatively useful something is, right? And it's the same way with this issue. All right, moving on. A reply says, it's not non-binding. Treaties generally have political limitations to their enforcement and some parts of it are aspirational, but it also has many small or uh, shall, has many shall, shall provisions. And there are clearly reporting requirements which have an impact on compliance and an effect. In international relations, many tools are useful to have an effect and the hammer of sanctions or enforcement is not an easy thing to implement. This is a big deal and it was a big deal when Trump pulled us out. Also, there will be additional negotiations and hopefully more parties joining and the US should be part of those discussions and play a role on the international stage on climate change. As long as there is a stage, that's, that's what's great, right? A reply to that says weird. These are unquestionably good executive orders that in no way prevent the government from doing more in addition to the Paris Agreement. Yet all the highest voted comments are negative. People raised the bar at a thousand miles an hour from Trump and blew straight past a reasonable pace for it at about eight hours. <laughs> oh man. Oh, uh, moving on. This is, it looks like a defense of the Paris Agreement. For everyone calling out the Paris Agreement, the whole thing was a massive exercise in getting China and the United States, the two main obstacles to curbing global carbon dioxide emissions, to collectively agree to stop ruining everything. Everyone else was there to convince them that environmental policies wouldn't create a trade disadvantage since everyone is doing it. But in the end, China and the United States are not going to curb emissions unless the other does as well. And the thing is, every single other country could stop polluting right now, and we still couldn't fix the environment without China or the US being on board. I wanna add real quick before I further in this comment. Um, so people will often say that China pollutes more now, and that is true at the moment, but it's also true that the US has contributed more to pol pollution historically because of the era of industrialization in the United States, where there was huge, huge, huge pollution on a very, very large scale for a long time. Um, like places like the Ohio River are to this day one of the single most polluted places or rivers in, in the planet. So 
we 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 are good at polluting as well like don't 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 think it's just china because china yeah they're polluting more now but we've polluted more total we are the the more polluters in the bigger picture you know we're the bigger the bigger polluters yeah we 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 did it <laughs> and it's also relevant to understand that per capita like per person the us is by far the biggest contributor of carbon emissions um, other countries like China and India have comparable carbon emissions as entire countries, but they have so many more people. So when you boil it down, the United States is the biggest contributor. The U.S. individuals can do the most to offset carbon, which is quite ironic considering the U.S. is one of the main places where people believe that climate change isn't the thing that matters. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Moving on. So, of course, when one of the big two polluters withdraws from the agreement, it loses all the force. The whole point was to convince the world that economic competition shouldn't stand in the way of environmentalism. And then the US comes, strips away its already weak environmental protections to a ridiculous degree, and starts a king trade war. Those other countries stayed in the agreement in hopes that eventually someone else would become president. All I see here are people complaining about the best available solution for being not good enough, without presenting a realistic political alternative. Yes, of course, if we all just agreed to stop polluting it would be great, but that's never been the problem. It's always been politics, not science, not economics, that's prevented the world from curbing em uh, emissions. I don't know if that's true, because it, it totally... Uh, you can't you can't say that science and economics aren't relevant to curbing emissions because the it's the scientific advantages that make produce the awareness of effective energy production and then it's the economic situation that lead individuals to be motivated to effectively produce energy that's what produces next level climate change Politics just produces the temporary, like, oh, yeah, we can limit this. You know, we're not going to build this plant. And you can help try and get people to set up infrastructure. But trying to convince politicians to build more renewable energy infrastructure isn't as easy as trying to figure out how do we make renewable energy structures profitable for companies and entities that spend a lot of money on power like that's an easier problem to tackle tackling getting politicians to do that kind of stuff is, is complicated so i don't agree with that part of this comment but aside from that super informative absolutely then they say the paris agreement was and is a practical political plan that exists in the present and works to resolve the issue people need to quit it with their perfect solution fallacy and that comment was by Enigmatic Cat. It shows a commitment to the requirements of the Accord and a commitment to addressing climate change. It's day one and we're back in it. There will be more from here. Stop being so cynical. And it means nothing without Senate approval. The president does not have the authority to agree to a treaty, which is technically what this is without it. I don't know how that works exactly in this case because he's not joining something that wasn't joined. So maybe he's just revoking the the fact that they left, which causes them to be in the treaty again. You know, it, it, things aren't that simple. <laughs> Another commoner says the problem with this is that countries will simply refuse to sign it. Politicians rely on donors. The big donors are or own companies. End of the day, most politicians have to listen. Otherwise, they'll lose their office, which will directly impact everyone around them. From their children being forced to switch schools, through having to let go of their staff, up to the simple fact that, for the most part, they'll stop being relevant. When following politics, especially in the United States, since apparently most media decided it's the most entertaining bit, it seems the only way to really make an impact fighting climate change would be if the president issued an executive order right before elections, or Congress ratifying a law, which would criminalize gerrymandering in reverse, plus permanently freeze voting district lines into, for lack of a better term, squares. Alternatively, the introduction of a popular vote system. Once the US starts leading again and stipulates foreign aid import export tariffs, 
on adopting green tech and lowering carbon emissions, we might maybe have a chance. I feel like you're barking up the wrong tree, really. Like, why, why, why do we have to try and convince people to reduce things and convince companies to change stuff when we could speak the language of companies, which is reducing expenses? Come on. That's what causes change. If it is cheap for a company to use oil and things with high carbon emission, they're going to continue to do it no matter how hard you try and convince them. You may be able to convince some of them not to, but they're going to keep doing it. What we have to change is how can we make it profitable for these companies to use other forms of renewable energy? How can we make it cheaper for people to use renewable energy? How can we do that? What can we fund that makes that possible? How do we reduce the cost? Right? I don't, I, I don't know. Barking up the wrong tree, I guess. There's actually a rich literature within global governance theory that discusses the value or lack of value of non-binding treaties. I had to write a paper on it a few years back when the treaty was created. I came down on the non-binding now will help make a binding one later and has soft power effects. So it was the best option that was politically viable. But there were others on my course who came down strongly on the other side. <laughs> you know, that's the funny things about opinions is uh, humans are tend to, we, like, there's not really much we agree on. And oftentimes we'll disagree just because it's another opinion. Like there is enough human psychology to want to be different that people will form different opinions than others just because of the fact that it's different. Not because they actually really agree or believe in what they're saying. And that's a reality. That's just how people tend to work. Not all the time, not all people. But yeah. Another reply says it also costs a fortune due to the UD buying emissions quotas from other countries. In essence, it's just polluting countries paying other countries to share in their quota, so the agreement actually achieves nothing but giving money away. A reply to that says you can't get a binding climate agreement if your country is so screwed up and backwards that you can't even join a non-binding one. The Paris Climate Agreement was never the end. It was just a step in the right direction. Sure, a lot of it was signaling, but the signal was that the US is willing to work towards a common goal in such a way as to not screw over the rest of the planet. Of course, uh, could not stand for that, and Trump, could, or Trump couldn't stand for that, since for him to win, everyone else must lose. It was like all agreements flawed. So was NAFTA, SALT, START, GATS, the UN, and every other treaty that's been made in the history of the world. That doesn't mean that it's not useful. Here's a reply. Here's a fact about the United States. All while Trump is lying to the coal miners, our solar output under Trump has increased by 40,000 milliwatts. Our wind is almost doubled, especially in Texas, with more rolling out. My point is that at this point, it's not really needed to be a binding contract because renewable energy, power grids being the majority of pollution, is now cheaper than coal-fired plants to operate. The only way we can truly be clean with current tech is to use nuclear as a baseload. The US just gets the pay into it more than anyone else, and yet we are the cleanest country. Why waste money when we need <laughs> when we need money for local programs, but we're not the cleanest country, that's the thing. We're actually by person the dirtiest country. We're the dirtiest people. Yeah. On that note, that's it! If you like this video, please leave a like, subscribe, or comment. I'm not going to make you subscribe if you don't want to. It's perfectly fine. I'm not going to tell you that all of you aren't subscribed. That's okay, too. Because, ultimately, if you're just watching the videos, that's a more useful thing than subscribing or anything. Like, if you watch five videos and you don't feel like subscribing, you know, that's okay. I don't mind. I understand. If you subscribe, it's because you really want it. And right now, I'm still figuring out, we're still figuring out, our team is still figuring out what this is. So, we want to reach out to people. If you want to 
make thumbnails like in this video or to use presentation software to record your screen just like I'm doing to make your own content where you read and react and summarize stuff online, please reach out to us. You can get our email from our about page on our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.